South Sudan marks four years of independence from Sudan, but concerns about ongoing violence and the threat of famine remain. How the Greek financial crisis and stock market swings in China could impact African investors. And Reels comes to the rescue of the homeless Miss USA pageant. Africa 54 starts right now. Good evening and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. First tonight, South Sudan marked four years of independence from Sudan on Thursday. While it should have been a day of jubilation, the celebrations were tempered by concerns about ongoing violence and severe food shortages. President Barack Obama's National Security Advisor Susan Rice on Thursday urged warring leaders in South Sudan to end their com uh, conflict and establish a transitional government. It breaks my heart to see what South Sudan has become today. Massive and widespread violence has returned. Human rights abuses are rampant. The government and rebels are committing appalling crimes against innocent women, children, and the elderly. President Kiir and Riak Machar and their cronies are personally responsible for this new war and self-inflicted disaster. And only leaders on both sides can end this violence. Yet, President Kiir and Riak Machar would rather haggle over personal power and wealth than agree on solutions. Meanwhile, you, the people of South Sudan, continue to suffer. Well, Ambassador Rice says the United States will hold accountable those who abuse the people of South Sudan and, along with the international community, punish those determined to drive South Sudan into the abyss, she said. Now, the UN's head of uh, peacekeeping, Hav uh, Ladzu, says the situation in South Sudan is absolutely appalling. Speaking to a small group of reporters, Latsu urged the Security Council Wednesday to impose sanctions and a comprehensive arms embargo on both the government and opposition in South Sudan. I think what really uh, should be looked at is the possibility of more sanctions towards uh, more leaders. And I do think, and that's what I said also, that there should be a decision about an arms embargo because it is really completely uh, questionable that the very meager resources that the country has uh, go into buying more weapons. This is really hard to accept. Well, I'd so criticize Salva Kiir and Rick Machar, saying he could not understand how two leaders who have such a stature could show such little regard for the welfare of their population. Now, the third International Conference on Financing for Development will take place July 13th to the 16th in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Stakeholders will discuss how to secure funding for sustainable development goals expected to be adopted by the United Nations in September. Among the attendees will be Fausin Wabwire, Senior Foreign Assistance Policy Analyst at the Bread for the World Institute. Ms. Wabwire, welcome to Africa 54. Thank you, Vincent. Now, we have mentioned that a little bit, but uh, just give us a sense of the objective of this uh, conference in Addis Ababa. So the third International Financing uh, for Development Conference aims to achieve an agreed intergovernmental um, support for the upcoming Sustainable Development Goals. It's essentially about determining how to finance the next global development agenda starting this year yeah. until 2030. Yeah, so someone will want to know who else is going to be there uh, besides you. Well, there will be myself, <laughs> and then there will be, um, it's actually a pretty high level um, representation um, from heads of state and government to ministers of finance and foreign affairs. The business community is a big part of this agenda as well as civil society. Yeah, you know, when many people in Africa hear about uh, raising uh, finance, they think of the IMF, the World Bank, uh, donors in the West. Uh, who else, who are you actually talking about here when you think about uh, raising funds? So what's interesting about the, the point of development that we are at right now is, is shifting away from externally driven um, resources yes. of, for development purposes to include domestically raised revenues, to include private 
financial flaws, which, by the way, constitute a big part of the development um, uh, budget today. Mm -hmm. And so all of these different sources of financing are going to come together to hopefully um, create a way that enables the global community to achieve the ambitious goals that we have set ourselves mm -hmm. towards. But again, you're looking at a continent that has about 54 countries with the different levels of uh, economic development. In terms of capacity, uh, is this something that is really viable in every country across the continent? I think first of all, I'll just say that country-led development, yeah. sustainable development will not happen unless countries themselves are able to drive that development, yeah. which is why I think strengthening the institutions at the local level both the public sector and private sector, civil society, citizens to engage collectively to um, drive their own development agenda. Bread for the World Institute is just about to publish a paper about strengthening local capacity and the fact that to achieve development outcomes uh, that are sustainable, it begins at the local yeah. level. So, but again, this is first recognizing what is the problem that you have, uh, the level of poverty in your country, what is the potential you have to deal with that poverty locally and what are the resources you possess? So do you get the sense that uh, uh, those policymakers, those individual nations are kind of getting a grip on this issue, making that assessment and kind of determining to use their own resources to do that? Or is this what you want to persuade them to do? Actually, there's already a lot of momentum on that, at least from the continent. I know there's the common African position which exactly speaks on that, the recognition that there is big opportunity for African countries to strengthen their own institutions so that they can better generate their revenues in addition to support that they will need from, from development partners. And the common African position actually stipulates that the role of official development assistance, which by the way, many countries still need, the role of the private sector and then philanthropies, there's a lot of resources there, but I don't think that they're being channeled or harnessed to the level that they should be. Uh, very quickly, uh, where are we today in terms of uh, fighting poverty? There is that goal of 2030, eliminating poverty. How realistic? You know, from the progress that we've seen over the last 15 years with the Minelem Development Goals, goal setting clearly shows that it pays. The world has been able to track some of these goals. The goal of end, uh, reducing poverty in half was actually achieved in 2010. That's 10 years ahead of its target in the year 2015. The hunger goal has made tremendous progress. It's complicated, but it's within reach, which is why the new set of goals, the Sustainable Development Goals, then gives us the opportunity to finish the unfinished agenda of the MDGs, mm -hmm. if you will. Very quickly, do, do, are there like very short-term assessment of uh, how quickly or how far are we in achieving those goals? So it? different countries have performed different, as you can imagine. The capacities yeah. that you talked about present uh, a mixed picture. Yeah. Uh, some countries are far along on other goals than others are. The biggest challenge to date is in fragile states, and we are seeing a massive increase on on fragility, we have the yeah. largest yeah. refugee number to date. Okay. So fragile states need specialized attention. And you'll come to tell us a little more about that when you come back from Absolutely. that country. Absolutely. Thank you. Faustin, thank you very much for joining it. us today. Faustin Obiri is a senior foreign assistance policy analyst at the Bread for the World Institute. Well, the killing of nine worshippers at a historic black church in Charleston, South Carolina by a white uh, gunman last month has rekindled the debate about gun control in America with a new element, race. VOA's Jerome Sokolovsky reports from a gun range near Charleston. Saturday morning at a shooting range in the Charleston suburb of Somerville. Nolan Welch and his brother William are here with their father, Kevin. And whenever you're ready to shoot. They learn about safety and marksmanship with a recognizable target. Here at the ATP gun shop and range, you can fire or buy many kinds of weapons. The Glock 43. From Derringer pocket pistols to hunting and sniper rifles, there's even a ladies line. And while one in three American households have guns, far more than in any other nation, many here believe the shooting at the church happened because there are not enough. I think people just need to be prepared to protect themselves for things like this that could happen every day. Um, I think 
an armed society makes better society. Gun advocates believe weapons used correctly make for a safer society. But after shootings like the one that happened here in Charleston, they feel very much on the defensive. For too long, we've been blind to the unique mayhem that gun violence inflicts upon this nation. President Barack Obama himself has noted that mass shootings are more frequent in America, and he's called for tougher gun laws. After the shooting at this church, activist minister Curtis Gatewood said the constitutional amendment citing a right to bear arms is being used to prevent the adoption of gun laws that would help black communities. We can't continue as if we are infringing upon the Second Amendment or other people's rights if we're talking about having sanity. Surveys show black Americans are more likely than whites to be killed by guns, though they are less likely to own guns. 15-year-old Tyler Brown came to the gun range with his father, David, who bucks that trend. You should always be armed because you never know when the bad guy is going to show up. In this case, one showed up in the church. Always be armed. I never leave home without mine. The Charleston murders have opened many Americans' eyes about what it means to be black in this country. But it's far from clear that will have any ramifications for the national gun culture. Jerome Sokolovsky, VOA News, Somerville, South Carolina. We want to know what you think about Africa 54 and the stories we cover during the conversation on Facebook. The address is Africa 54 and check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Find me on Twitter at VOA Vince McCory. Coming up, a closer look at the United Nations push to combat poverty. Stay with us. From science and technology, here's What's New. What's New is a prototype of a material that reacts to water. As a graduate student at the Royal College of Art in London, Chow Chen was out and about on a rainy day when he picked up a pine cone and noticed that it reacted to water by closing the tiles of its outer shell. Chow went to the lab and created a laminate that mimics the pine cone. He built a shelter covered with tiles made of this material that opens up on sunny days and closes when it rains. Another use, covering a building with this material which reacts to rain, exposing a different facade underneath. And how about this, planting a strip of this material in the pots of your house plant so that when it senses dry soil, it turns color. Chow says a lot more testing needs to be done, but hopefully soon it shall be known the worldly value of the common pine cone. For VOA's What's New, I'm Todd Grossans. Wherever you are, Voice of America is on. On air, reaching more than 130 million. Weekly, worldwide, in more than 40 languages. Online, social media and breaking news from around the world. On the go, dozens of new features on popular platforms with new apps and trending topics. Voice of America, on air, online, on the go. Well, in business, the financial crisis in Greece continues as Greeks await a Sunday deadline uh, to come up with uh, far-reaching reforms to be approved by European Union leaders. Well, meanwhile, China's stocks fall and rise again. So what could all this mean for African investors? For some perspectives, business reporter Alexis uh, Christopher sat down with Larry Seruma of Nile Capital Management. Larry, Greece is teetering on the brink of financial collapse. China is in a bear stock market right now. Do you see these as buying opportunities for African investors? And how is this shaping your investment decisions? Uh, we always like to invest where most people are fearful. So events in Greece have the effect of lowering the euro, and that has an impact on many African economies. So I invest in China. Um, you know, the stock market sell-off has an impact with regard to China-Africa trade, mm -hmm. and that has an impact in terms of lowering uh, stock prices for many uh, 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 stocks in, in Africa. Do you think that China's stock market sell-off poses more of a threat to Africa than Greece does right now? China is a larger economy than Greece, and China is a large trading partner compared to Greece. 
Um, so the events in China have a meaningful impact in Africa. In addition to that, China has made a long-term commitment to invest in Africa. Mm -hmm. So as a result, China is a much more trading partner now uh, than Greece would be or Europe in general. Mm -hmm. The sell-off in China has had a ripple effect through the commodities market, specifically oil and copper. Do you see these as good plays right now in this environment? Um, commodities have been challenged for a very long period of time. Mm -hmm. uh, five years mainly for the industry metals. Uh, oil and gas has pretty much collapsed over the last one year. What we do find is most of commodity stocks are looking cheap from a valuation standpoint. So to the extent that there's a long-term story with regard to natural resources, mm -hmm. commodity stocks are looking very interesting at these levels. Now moving to, to Africa now, Nigeria's president has yet to make good on his promise to devalue the currency there. What does this mean for foreign investment coming into Nigeria? Yes, so in one way the uh, good political transition between one government to another is a good catalyst to invest in Nigeria, but the fact that the government or uh, Buhari has not um, uh, formed a cabinet or had any meaningful policy with regard to the economy where it means devaluing the dollar, what that means is a lot of investors like us are really on hold and waiting to see what the policy is and how much they are going to devalue the Naira. The Naira will have to be devalued, but we're all waiting to see how much that devaluation will be. Right. Right now, where do you see the greatest growth opportunities within Africa? So from a growth, from a growth standpoint, uh, East Africa is interesting at these levels for a number of reasons. Uh, they tend to be uh, oil importers, for, so the collapse in oil prices is a major catalyst for most of oil importing uh, economies. Mm -hmm. uh, but they have also had some good political transitions, so that's positive as well. Nigeria is always interesting. It's the largest economy. They've just gone through a good political transition. If Buhari delivers on the fight on corruption, if Buhari delivers on economic policy, mm -hmm. it's really an economic engine uh, for Africa. So it's interesting in that respect. And what about um, how you consider African markets on a whole? They, they've for a long time been considered frontier markets. Do you think that they or some of them have graduated to emerging markets and why? There's a good case to really make the case that some markets are going to transition into emerging markets. Maybe not yet. Uh, the main reason has been liquidity. In most of these uh, economies, the liquidity is much lower relative to emerging markets. Mm -hmm. But as they continue to grow and as they continue to be more transparent, yes, we are hoping to see more African uh, markets uh, transition to emerging markets. And what can or should African markets be doing to attract more foreign capital? The number one thing is transparency. Um, they need to be more transparent. Uh, they need to be better with uh, regulating their markets. And above all, they need to reduce the regulations with regard to taxes and with regard to uh, allowing foreign investments into their economies. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the three key ones I would point out. And at Nile Capital Management, what are you investing in right now? Uh, so what we really do like uh, is consumer-related names. Uh, so anything to do with, say, goods and services, whether it's distribution of food or going as far as farming operations, those are really interesting plays. Uh, we also like a lot of the financial services stock, it, mainly in the insurance sector. So, um, but across the board, if I would categorize, we really like consumer-related names and infrastructure-related names. Mm -hmm. And, and again, for, for the African investors sitting back and watching what's happening on the global stage, would you say, look, don't panic but stay on the sidelines with regards to Europe or China, or no, these are buying opportunities? Our view is that when most investors are very fearful, that's the time for you to invest. So these are good times to invest. So where uh, most investors are concerned about Europe, it's a time to really think about what are the opportunities in Europe, which stocks present good entry points now, and whether it regards Africa as well, most investors may be selling African stocks because of the fear in China or what's happening in Europe. Again, that's an opportunity to really think about um, uh, buying in some of these names that are, are, being, uh, are being sold right now. All right, well, Larry Saruma of Nile Capital Management, thanks so much for your insights today. Thank you for having me, Alex. And I'm Alexis Christophorus, VOA News for Africa 54. Well, I'm joining us now is Africa 54 Health correspondent Lino Mudu.
What do you have for us today, Lino? Hello, Vincent. While the first trial of an oral cholera vaccine was successful and could speed up global efforts against the disease, the trial took place in Bangladesh where cholera is endemic and nearly 270,000 people participated in the trial. The vaccine, Shanghol, was given as part of routine health services to both adults and children and was found to protect against severe cases of cholera. The study shows that even with moderate vaccination coverage, cases of severe life-threatening cholera were reduced by nearly 40% among those vaccinated, which included children age 5 and under. The report was published recently in the medical journal, The Lancet. And a new report says one in three people or 2.4 billion people are still without sanitation facilities. The Joint Monitoring Program report, Progress on Sanitation and Drinking Water 2015 Update and MDG Assessment says access to improved drinking water sources has been a major achievement for countries and the international community. 91% of the global population now have improved drinking water since 1990 and the number is still growing. The report published by the World Health Organization and UNICEF says worldwide only 68% of the world's population uses an improved sanitation facility, 9% below the MDG target of 77%. Now, the United Nations says, despite progress made on the Millennium Development Goals, well, hundreds of millions more people are still poor and suffer from hunger. In a report analyzing eight development goals set out in the Millennium Declaration in 2000, the United Nations says the number of people living in extreme poverty has more than halved from 1.9 billion in 1990 to 836 million. The report confirms that the global efforts to achieve the goals have saved millions of lives and improved conditions for millions more around the world. The MDGs helped to lift more than 1 billion people out of extreme poverty and make major inroads against hunger. They have enabled more than 2.6 billion people to gain access to an improved drinking water source and more girls to attend school than ever before. The number of children dying before their fifth birthday has fallen by more than half since 1990. But despite the gains, 16,000 children still die each day, mostly from preventable causes. And progress has been uneven across regions and countries. Progress has not reached everyone. Too many people have been left behind, particularly the poorest and those disadvantaged because of their sex, age, disability, ethnicity, or geographic location. Too many women and children continue to die during pregnancy or from childbirth-related complications. And too many people lack adequate sanitation facilities, especially in rural areas. WHO and UNICEF warn lack of progress on sanitation threatens to undermine the child's survival and health benefits from gains in access to safe drinking water. One in three people are still without sanitation. With regards to HIV-AIDS, Sub-Saharan Africa remains the region most severely affected by the HIV epidemic. There were 1.5 million new infections in 2013. Almost half of them occurred in just three countries, Nigeria, South Africa and Uganda. World leaders are due to adopt a set of new development objectives known as the Sustainable Development Goals, SDGs, at the UN summit in September. The new goals aim to eradicate extreme poverty by the year 2030. And that's our Africa Health Report for today. Back to you, Vincent. Well, thank you very much uh, for joining us today, Lino. Be sure to watch for Lino Mudu every Tuesday and Thursday for the latest health news in Africa right here on Africa 54. It's time now for a short break. Still to come on Africa 54, the Miss USA pageant gets a new home. We'll be right back.
88th meeting of the Security Council was closed. At this present moment, I haven't been up there for, for several weeks. Welcome back to Africa 54. Here's what's trending. The Miss USA pageant left without a TV home following a blowback against co-owner Donald Trump over his comments on Mexican immigrants has been rescued by the Reels Channel. Trump's uh, presidential campaign announcement contained his assertion that some Mexican immigrants to the United States uh, bring drugs and crime and some are rapists. Uh, the pageant will have to scramble after mass exodus of performers, hosts and judges who cited opposition to Trump's views as the reason. Uh, the Miss USA pageant will be televised July the 12th. One well, next up, a clip of Wimbledon's surprise uh, goes viral. John McEnroe swapped his role as a Wimbledon commentator for a chauffeur car driver, surprising two unsuspecting tennis fans on a journey to the All England Club. Tom Payne and Nick Webb were selected to take part in the secret chauffeur stunt and offered a VIP trip to Wimbledon as part of a promotional campaign. En route to Wimbledon, the real chauffeur jumped out the car to be replaced by John McEnroe as he took hold of the wheel. Well, and finally, could a South Korean marriage trend catch on with average wedding expenditures last year at nearly $64,000? More couples are opting for smaller functions as the economy slows, the age at marriage rises, and parents nearing retirement have less money to splurge. South Korean weddings are typically a show of status with hundreds of guests and expensive gifts. Huge marriage expenses prompt money young, many yet more young people to delay marriage and consequently children, worsening one of the world's lowest birth rates in a population that is aging the fastest in, in the industrialized world. Now, the small wedding trend also brings relief for parents as South Koreans in their 50s and 60s are the most heavily indebted, indebted in a country whose household debt uh, ranks among the world's highest. And that is what is trending today. And that's our show for today. Be sure to uh, watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. Uh, for more news, tune in to VOA's evening radio show, African News Tonight at 1800 UTC. And in the mornings today, break Africa between 0300 and 0600 UTC, Monday through Friday. Thanks a lot for watching. From all of us in Washington, have a good night. What is The Scoop? It's real talk, real issues, the real Africa. That's The Scoop with Salim Amin. Meet the latest game changers in Africa. Learn who inspires and leads. Entrepreneurs and trailblazers and people making a difference in Africans' lives. Monday through Friday on VOA. Find your time zone and get The Scoop. We are able to touch on things that are important to people on an everyday basis. Hello and welcome. I'm Vincent McCory. This is Africa 54. In a lively half hour, news, sports, health, lifestyle information, comments from our viewers. Africa 54, the best for Africa about Africa. Join us only on VOA.